today to our uh, presentation on uh, cold weather injury and its sequelae. Um, I'd like to offer a special welcome to uh, the uh, vets that we have present today, as well as to our guests and visitors uh, and to staff members here at the Seattle VA Medical Center. Uh, as we all know, cold weather injury and sequelae of cold weather injury have for a long time and are presently uh, increasingly important to the veteran population, particularly to vets uh, who served uh, in Korea, also vets that served during World War II, and uh, to uh, prisoners of war, uh, as well as veterans who've experienced cold weather injury in training either in the Northern uh, States, uh, Alaska, or in Europe during their time in the service. And uh, it is becoming an increasing, um, uh, increasingly important uh, concern among vets and one that we are um, uh, trying to uh, address more um, uh, appropriately uh, for the veterans involved. Uh, I'm glad to uh, be here and have the privilege and honor of uh, introducing our speaker today, Dr. William Mills. Uh, Dr. Mills has a distinguished uh, career, uh, not only uh, in his uh, profession, but also uh, his military career. Uh, he served in the U.S. Navy in World War II between 1942 and 1945 in both the Atlantic and the Pacific. Also served uh, in the Navy um, uh, Reserves Medical Corps between 1956 and 1978, uh, and uh, served in Vietnam in 1966 and 1967. He uh, retired as a rear admiral in 1978. Uh, Dr. Mills did his uh, medical training at Stanford University and the University of Michigan, as well as at Vanderbilt. Uh, he is an orthopedic surgeon and uh, for uh, several years was uh, one of two orthopedic surgeons in uh, all of the state of Alaska, and for many years was the only orthopedic surgeon in Anchorage. Um, he became interested in cold weather injury uh, both through his military activities and also through his uh, uh, medical activities in Alaska. and uh, has. Uh, numerous articles and uh, does uh, significant uh, consultation and lecturing on cold weather injuries as well as cold weather injury. Um, he is going to be talking to us today about uh, cold weather injury and sequelae, uh, evaluation, and appropriate management. So we're very pleased to have Dr. Mills with us here today, and I'd like to ask you to uh, join me in the greeting. Is that working? Is your machine working? Thank you, doctor, for the introduction. And uh, it would appear from the introduction that I just had that, uh, that I'm a veteran. But I wouldn't like to deceive you because uh, it wasn't too long ago that uh, I was attending a children's clinic in Anchorage, Alaska. And the prosthetists, like most prosthetists are, you know, they know everything more than anybody else, stopped me and said, Doctor, you're a living disgrace to orthopedic surgery. And I said, Why is that? And he said, Well, you're walking around here, you have an artificial limb that clicks and clacks and makes a lot of noise. How old is that leg anyway? And I said, well, I have to know that exactly. It's, I bought it in 1966 when I was uh, in combat medical school at Camp Pendleton and about to go to Vietnam. And it's so, so comfortable that I think that's the secret of an artificial limb and I've never had occasion to change it even though it's been repaired. And, had nuts and bolts and screws and everything else put in it to keep it going. He said, no, I, I really feel that I should make a new leg for you. I said, well, perhaps you're right. And when I was at Pendleton, I paid $400 for this limb I wore from 1966 to 1993. And I said, well, what will it cost me? Because I figured that Uncle Sam had put me through medical school and I purchased all of my own artificial limbs after I left my training in Ann Arbor, and he said, well, between six and seven thousand dollars. And I said, oh, man, I could buy a car for that kind of money. And then I thought about it, and I decided, okay, I'll let the VA buy this lake for me. So I went down to this area there in Anchorage, the VA center, 
and I had a prosthetic service card with that beautiful picture taken 25 years ago. And, and uh, I said, I'm here because I'm thinking of applying for an artificial limb. And they said, well, are you a veteran? I said, I'm just about the most veteran veteran you've ever seen. I've got a VA stacked that high and a Navy stacked that high. And he said, well, what's your number? So I gave him a number. And it took an inordinate amount of time before this superior officer and administrator came back to me almost uh, 45 minutes and said, Doctor, I'm sorry, but according to our information, you're not a veteran. I said, really? He said, yes, the man with your number died in Los Angeles 25 years ago. So uh, anyway, he said, however, if you really think you're a veteran, you can fill out the forms and he gave me a stack of material like I were joining the Marine Corps or the State Department all over again, you know, and then I walked out a, a little bit peeved, I would think. And so then finally I got a hold, I came down here because some people in Washington and native Massachusetts said you were looking to investigate the sequelae problems of the people uh, in Korea, the chosen reservoir individuals in World War II, and wanted to know if I would help. And one of the people uh, guiding me through all this was Mr. Ron Cole, BFW, the American Legion. And uh, somehow, he did a lot of work. And the first thing I know in Anchorage, I got a letter. I had applied for nothing. I'd asked for nothing except for a prosthetic service card. And uh, incidentally, the price of the limb in Anchorage, Alaska now is $14,000. So, uh, you know, that that's uh, extortion, if you want my opinion, but that's what I did. Anyhow, um, the VA in Anchorage did say that uh, without even my applying for it, you are now compensated for X number of dollars per month, 40% disability for artificial limb. They said, however, your application for PTSD will have to think about it. And, uh, you know, maybe you think I belong and my wife thinks I belong to PTSD, but I didn't think so. But the big thing I wanted to tell you was, after all, I, I still didn't have a prosthetic service card. Anyhow, well, so now you know what my particular problems are. When I first came to Alaska in 1952, I took care of some fishermen in Bristol Bay after one big storm where we lost something like 10 boats, about 20 fishermen with severe wet, cold injury, and death due to hypothermia. And then later on, I was holding a clinic in Kodiak, Alaska, and I examined 26 people who had been on a fishing boat. I examined 13 people on a fishing boat who had 26 problems of freezing injury and immersion injury. And they had been rescued by the third day and brought into Kodiak. And because of the problems of their legs and their hands, they had amputated about five or six of those people at the wrist and done amputations at the level of the ankle or BK amputation and one AK amputation of this entire group. And I thought that's a terrible price to pay for cold injury. So I began investigating cold injury. And there in Alaska, we then developed a program uh, or a system of care for cold injury that began with the methods of rapid rewarming that Merriman and Bethesda had espoused after his work in Korea and went on to a total whole program. At the present time, we've covered approximately 1,500 individuals of various kinds of cold injury. And I'm going to take you on a walk through the problems of cold injury at this time and then tell you in the second aspect after a little break about some of the sequelae I've noticed which you're really interested in in regard to cold. Now, historically, and, and I'd like to point this out because the problems of cold and the sequelae of cold have been with us for centuries. And it's just unfortunate with all the problems of cold we have we haven't collected the data on the sequelae long before this. But here you can see where a Greek general whose name was Xenophon went into Persia uh, with 10,000 Greeks. And the interesting part of this was he went across through Asia Minor uh, down into a, an area here uh, which 
is presently known as Baghdad. But if you look very carefully down in this particular area, you see the old biblical town of Babylon. And Babylon, which you're familiar with, I'm sure, from your Bible studies or the literature, is approximately 14 to 16 miles from Baghdad, so much a, a city so prominent in the war desert storm. And the interesting thing about Xenophon's travels is that they came this way, down into this particular area uh, near Babylon, and went up through the Kurdistan area and mountains, back into uh, uh, the shore of Asia Minor, where eventually they came back to Greece after having lost 8,000 of the 10,000 men that started, all due to hypothermia, exposure, and various forms of cold injury. Now I show this because when the U.S. forces landed after Desert Storm, most of them in their summer uh, uniforms, if they'd gone on to Baghdad and chased the, the uh, Iraqi remnants uh, or group into the mountains, they would have been facing very severe winters. And those winters are demonstrated by the civilian population, Kurdistani people, uh, an exodus over the mountains in towards Turkey. And the big problem with those was not only various uh, forms of uh, cold injury, but severe exposure causing the death, particularly of children and the elderly people. And it raised a question, and I don't know whether the VA handles this or not, but not only are uh, soldiers, sailors, and Marines victims of cold in many of these wars, particularly those on the losing side and in treat, but the civilian population suffers mightily as well. Now, as you know from reading, one of the greatest debacles in history was the retreat of Napoleon as he came out of uh, Russia in 1812, uh, 1813. And here you see the French army fleeing across the Berezina River, a very severe uh, Russian winter hastening them. Uh, the Russians themselves all around them hastening them. And these people, having put up a couple of bridges, uh, pontoon-type bridges, some couldn't wait, and so they jumped into the river to try to swim across. And of course, many of them were totally immersed, totally wet, uh, sustained uh, uh, severe heat loss, and perished uh, uh, most often probably from exposure for hypothermia. And those that built bivouac fires later on, if they were permitted to do so, uh, standing in front of the fire, the part that was already uh, exposed to uh, immersion injury or trench foot over their campaign, or was truly frozen, uh, now was exposed to extreme to temperature, and they burnt the, burnt the part that was already frozen. Now, this is a picture uh, uh, of the uh, Khyber Pass, approximately 1842, uh, uh, when the British went into Afghanistan and were driven out of Kabul uh, by the uh, Afghans and uh, flee fled through this particular pass with something like 14,000 troops. Those were British regulars, uh, native sepoy troops, as well as uh, women and children from the garrison in Kabul. And this is a very famous painting you uh, may have seen of Dr. Bryden, who was the only survivor, Caucasian survivor, along with two uh, Indian soldiers of the 14,000 uh, plus uh, army that initially fled through the pass. And all of them died either from Afghan attacks or from cold injury, uh, with the exception of uh, 20 women and children that the Afghan troops originally uh, allowed to go free and were later uh, allowed to rejoin the, the British Army. Now, there's no end to this sort of thing, and I just <coughs> want to tell you what my real message is, that no matter what else you think, cold injury is always with us. Uh, <coughs> you can uh, do all you can in the method of treatment, but you'd probably do better to do something in the method uh, of prevention. And here's an Italian army in the Balkans in about uh, 1941. Uh, this army left Italy, went across uh, through the Yugoslavia, down into the Balkans towards Greece with the idea of isolating Greece. They had a winter storm uh, as well as uh, uh, problems facing them from the Greek and Albanian irregulars, and uh, somehow 60,000 men disappeared. Now, I thought it would be interesting to know what happened to 60,000 Italian soldiers, so I called uh, some people I knew in Italy and talked to uh, one admiral uh, that was over there, and he told me the story was that they did lose the army. 
they lost all the records after it was surrendered, and they didn't know what happened to them. They had no trace of them, and 60,000 men have just disappeared, secondary, presumably, to coal. Well, if this continues, in 1982, of course, there was the Battle of the Falklands, and as you may know, there were severe cold injuries on both sides, primarily on the Argentinian side, but a large number of injuries uh, in the British forces. And here you see some paratroopers landing, and uh, they landed on the beach in their uh, parade uh, dress uh, boots or their field boots. They didn't have vapor barrier boots or rubber boots. Uh, they were wet. Uh, they were given three or four days to uh, attack the heights and take the heights, which uh, like good the British Marines and commandos, they did. But they had a lot of severe injury, and particularly uh, immersion injury from one of the ships that was sunk. Uh, what were their choices? Well, first of all, they had as much as 20 or 30 days coming down to the Falklands. It was winter time in the Falkland area, and in this age of computers, they probably could have pushed in a few uh, uh, notes and said, what's it like in the Falklands, and what should we be wearing? At any rate, uh, they had many choices. They could have stopped and uh, changed their socks. Uh, they could have pitched tents. They could have had helicopter lifts. I'm not being critical, but I'm just saying why did this tremendous number, uh, uh, why did these people have so much problems? As a matter of fact, uh, they could have even surrendered. You wouldn't expect a Marine of any country to do that. But the problem was that they had many, many incidences of various forms of cold injury, even in 1982, after all the knowledge that we had over the years. Well, this is Alaska where I've done much of my work, and you see this is a country, uh, it's a very mountainous country. Uh, we have approximately five and a half to six months of winter. Uh, we have three or four months uh, of darkness, uh, uh, plus or minus a few hours. And here you can see a shrimp boat in the uh, Gulf of Alaska. And here's one of those sailboats that they used up until 1952 without engines in, in the Bristol Bay area. Now we have a, a, a real interesting a group of people in uh, the Bering Sea and the Gulf of Alaska in this regard. There are approximately uh, 350 boats of one kind or another, anywhere from 45 feet to 212 to 300 feet in both of those waters. Up until about uh, a few years ago, for almost 100 years, and we still average this now, we lose one vessel a week in the northern waters of Alaska. Now, we used to lose all of their crews, but now with the, the new rescue techniques and the hyper uh, electronic devices and with the, the uh, survival suits and with the increased number of boats and with the Coast Guard presence that has increased, we now save about 90% of the crews, although we still lose the vessel a week. And what that means is that for the first time we're seeing large numbers of patients who previously drowned out of the waters of the Bering Sea and Bristol Bay with very severe immersion injury. One aspect that precedes all of this frost plate very often is cold stress, a uh, very interesting psychic response when some soldiers or sailors or anyone comes to Alaska and sees the tremendous uh, uh, far reaches of ice and snow, perhaps for the first time, followed by an overwhelming depression and a stress syndrome with curling ulcer. Now, it's not well known that we have this problem, but non-freezing injury, trench foot immersion injury, chill blains, which occurs mostly in the fingertips and people working out in the, in the canneries in the wintertime, are found quite often. And this, I've always said over the years, occurs at low temperatures near but above the freezing level. And I will show you some interesting change. I've changed my mind a little bit there. You can still have trench foot immersion injury and other problems. The temperature is well below the freezing level, providing that your foot doesn't freeze, but is wetted and cold, and uh, the temperatures can be such that in most cases you'd have frostbite otherwise, but uh, this doesn't happen particularly if you have vapor barrier boots. And I'll discuss that. The vapor barrier boot is probably one of the greatest boots, I think, to prevent cold injury. But 10% of all the individuals usually in the United States, roughly 10%, have hyperhidrosis, not after the effect or after the freezing or after the immersion injury, but they are normally hyperhidrotic and they sweat a lot. So this vapor barrier boot that's supposed to prevent the freezing injury is such that it fills up with water 
And if you don't empty it or take care or change your socks three or four times every day, then the very boot that protects you from freezing, and it will, gives you a nice nasty case of, of uh, immersion injury or wet cold injury. Here you see a shrimp boat in the Gulf of Alaska. It filled up, as you can see, the weather rail went under. It, it was covered with ice and, and all the rigging, and the men knew it was just a matter of time before it sank. So they abandoned the boat that got into a raft, and there were three men in the raft and only two survival suits. This is kind of interesting because this man didn't have the survival suit, but he was held between the, he was cuddled between the uh, two men that were in the survival suits, and the only complaint they had was that this man had severe cold diuresis, which you'd expect being unprotected, and he urinated all over him. And what happened then, because the cold, of course, he became first hypovolemic with all the fluids driven into other parts of the body, and then he became severely dehydrated. And he was finally rescued after the fifth day. Here you see the great big and then the swollen foot. Uh, it demonstrates such tremendous swelling that I did a uh, measurement uh, of intercompartmental pressure, as well as doing a tech scan. You see the technician scan and isotope of molybdenum showed the cutoff right about the level uh, of the arch, and uh, the pressures were greater than 100 millimeters of mercury, which is normal pressure being approximately 37 millimeters of mercury in the tissue. Consequently, I uh, uh, did a fasciotomy on both sides, and here you can see that the fasciotomy extended well up into the area of tibial tuberosity, and you can see an area right in here that's dusky and dark, uh, demonstrating impending necrosis of the anterior tibial compartment muscles. Well, he did well, and after skin graft, we sent him back here to Seattle, and uh, he then recuperated for six or eight months, and lo and behold, went back out on a fishing boat again. So as far as I know, he's done well. Now, can that be lightened up any? Perhaps not. That's right. Well, what, what you have here is an individual who had been on a fishing boat that sank in the Bering Sea. He'd been in the water about 12 hours, was picked up and put in a raft, and then delivered to Anchorage after a period of about three days. That's okay. That's good. And you can <laughs> see here where we prepped this, and he has still swelling and edema. And this is the post-hyperemic stage, where there's severe pain, redness, swelling. You can see the redness in this particular area here increased tissue pressures, and uh, uh, a man in considerable danger of having uh, great difficulty unless the fasciotomy was done. Well, fortunately, his pressures went down immediately. And a year and a half later, he was sent back to Anchorage for evaluation by me, not sent by a physician as a matter of interest, but as so many of these people are sent by his attorney. And uh, here you can see one of the immediate follow-ups, and you can tell how soon sequelae occur, particularly in immersion injury. This man is developing the hammer toe deformity at 18 months. He's developing early fungus uh, uh, disease, particularly at a large nail. It often starts in that particular area, and some loss of sensation uh, uh, throughout the feet with uh, pain, and particularly pain upon weight carrying. Now, we've had a very similar case that unfortunately had a freeze injury on top of his immersion injury, and the result of that is usually a disaster. You lose the part if you have a freezing injury on top of immersion injury uh, at the level of the last freeze. And here, when we did uh, a metatarsal amputation and studied some of the tissue, you can see in this particular area, uh, right up in here, the uh, internal laminar membrane. This is the what is left of the uh, foramen, the lumen of the artery. And here you can see the endothelial cell system breaking off into the lumen. Here you see the massive clot that's formed. And here you can see the area of the adventitia. Now, this is important because it tells us something that weren't quite aware of until a few years ago, and that is that one of the first victims to cold occurs at about 60, 50 degrees 
uh, Fahrenheit is the endothelial cell of the arterial system. So even with hypothermia or trench foot, let alone a freezing injury, you have this disruption. And of course, if you disrupt the endothelial cell system, you particularly lose all of the transfer mechanism uh, from the lumen of the artery with all the nutrients that going in and, and uh, other uh, materials uh, coming out that, that are utilized in the function, uh, particularly for maintaining a healthy foot or a healthy hand. Uh, I don't know what we're going to do about this. Uh, because at the moment we have no uh, set treatment for endothelial cell loss. Now when we're talking about frostbite, we're talking about true tissue freezing. And it's described as a heat loss that occurs in sufficient amount to permit ice formation, the superficial or the very deep tissues. And if you have a limb that has superficial injury, it's very difficult because of the hard uh, core hard shell that's formed to determine how deep the injury is without other uh, examination. What happens, uh, for a reason we're not sure, but at any rate it's cold enough that a small spicule of ice forms in the extracellular space. And as that ice forms, it draws fluid uh, to it uh, from uh, the uh, extracellular space as well as from the cell itself. And eventually, as this great big mass of ice increases, it uh, dehydrates the cell, and you can see here that there's tremendous uh, change in, uh, throughout the cell uh, cells, and so much so that they're flattened, they're compressed, uh, they're dehydrated, and there's much loss of uh, protein uh, uh, tissue within the cell, uh, as well as cell-bound protein mass water. And, uh, what happens if you don't rapidly rewarm the patient, at least one method of treatment now, is that when you thaw the individual, this mass, of course, melts, but if you do thawing spontaneously or by other means, then it refreezes until the temperatures get to about uh, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And consequently, other than rapid rewarming that causes very rapid uh, uh, dissolution uh, and melting of this mass, you get the increase in the, in the ice mass between the cells that causes mechanical damage to the cells. Now the freezing injury that we see in Alaska here is superficial or deep frostbite, a mixed injury, an immersion injury, for instance, followed by freezing. That's always a disaster. A freeze-thaw, refreeze injury. And when you get that, you almost always lose the part at the level of the second freeze. High altitude hypoxia followed by freezing it is a severe injury. And one of the worst is compartment compression and freezing because of compression of the blood cells, the neurovascular bundles, so that uh, warm blood can't get to the part and often results uh, after fracture, particularly in amputation. And then extremity fracture freezing, and you almost always lose a major part of the limb if you don't uh, do rapid rewarming uh, following an extremity fracture freezing. And then there's one other little uh, area here, and that's hypothermia associated with a freezing injury. Now, we had quite a time in this country in the early 60s uh, when we were developing this method of treatment, and particularly a gentleman whose name was Campbell from Switzerland uh, was vociferous and, and complaining about what was happening in Anchorage, Alaska. So the Air Force put on a great big symposium bringing people from all over the country. What it amounted to was Mills and Merriman from Bethesda were recommending rapid rewarming, and Dr. Campbell was recommending warming gradually, and uh, you can see the kind of the confrontation that uh, we had between each other, and as a result of that, finally, we convinced the people in Europe that probably some form of gradual uh, or rapid rewarming was uh, effective. Now, uh, this is where a lot of our patients come from. This is Mount McKinley, 20,300 feet, and we have a camp right up in here in this area. Uh, right here you can see our camp put out that we were under the guise of the University of uh, uh, Anchorage and this is one of our huts and this is a hut at the 7,300 feet level where we landed uh, uh, our aircraft to travel up to 14,000 feet and here's our camp at the 14,300 foot level and we have solar panels here for uh, battery power. Uh, we operate between April and the 1st of July, so there's always plenty of light. But here you see a very particular, uh, interesting uh, 
phenomena uh, that's present uh, over Mount McKinley uh, periodically as well as many other mountains, and it's a lenticular cloud. And when this lenticular cloud forms, the winds are between 100 and 150 miles per hour. So climbers that are caught on the mountain very often get into great difficulty, as well as some of the researchers who are there. And most of the time, that is not true, about half the time our people doing research up in Mount McKinley were acting as uh, rescue specialists for those that got themselves in trouble on the mountain. From that, we, we came up with something like this. Here is a dilemma for mountaineers. This is a Canadian group down up to 19,000 feet. Both men, two men, uh, good climbers, and they froze their hands and froze their feet. That's one time. And because they were that far, they were up at 19,000 feet, they decided to go the rest of the way. So after putting their feet and their hands in the axilla and the groin of each other, uh, and they thawed them, and the next morning they stuffed their feet uh, into their boots, uh, and they stuffed their hands into their gloves, and they went up uh, another 1,500 uh, feet. And when they got to the summit, they refroze their hands and refroze their feet. And so when they came down and were rescued by Chopper, uh, eventually, you can see on the 25th, this was the pattern they had. And they're in the whirlpool, which is their standard method of, of warming, as well as massage. And then two days later, they had developed liquefaction necrosis of the toes. And as you can see here, uh, three days later, that liquefaction uh, has continued. And in another two days, there's total auto amputation of the part. And in about two weeks, this is the final result. And a surgeon hasn't even touched these feet because of the severe injury that occurred. So from that, we have a dictum that we hold to as rigidly if we can. That is, do not rewarm in the rescue area if there's any danger of refreezing because you can remain in the frozen state considerable length of time without having any trouble. Now, the cellular changes that occur are first during the freezing episode itself. And there's structural damage by ice growth, protein denaturation, a huge electrolyte concentration, pH changes, particularly acidosis, inter and extracellular, severe dehydration with this in the cell, and that may be the most damaging of all, and loss of protein bound water. And so we have this little thing that's out besides thinking heat. We want everyone to think water, because as soon as you're cold, uh, particularly uh, due to vasoconstriction, the arterias, our small arteries uh, and arterioles, pump blood out of the arms and out of the legs into the deeper system. So what you have essentially is a hypovolemia. And when you're out there with the hypovolemia, you sometimes get a message from uh, these areas that are flooded, like the abdomen and the chest, to the hypothalamus and says, hey, I'm filled with water down here. And the hypothalamus said, okay, uh, let's go into a little cold diuresis and the result more or less following that is that you begin urinating and you lose uh, uh, water that's essential, especially essential out in the cold. So the patient with hypovolemia soon develops dehydration. And particularly mountain climbers by the second or third week are so tired that they find it very difficult to melt uh, a gallon of water of, of which they're only going to get a half a pint of water to drink. Now cellular changes occur during freezing as well as thawing. And the cell membranes rupture. There's damage to the intracellular organs, the nuclei. There's abnormal cell wall permeability, these cell walls leak. Enzymes are destroyed. There's damage to the capillaries themselves, injury to the arterial venous walls, and mitochondrial damage to the muscle cells so oxygen is not transferred well. And here you can see another individual. This is a freezing injury, not immersion. Here you see, beginning way over here, uh, the uh, adventition, the muscular layer, the endothelium and the lamina. And here's this long strip of endothelium going down here that's stripped away, no longer functional, and also acts as a plug in the arterial lumen. And here you have a major clot within the lumen itself. Now I show this one to show you this is a capillary system. And the only reason I show this is when we're talking about things that happen in the cold, and we know there's endothelial damage, we have to recognize that the capillaries themselves are composed primarily of endothelial cells. So the capillary system damage causes great destruction of cells. Now, free oxygen radicals are something that have been uh, thought about in the last seven or eight years, particularly with cardiac surgery. 
as well as cold injury, and phagocytic cells, monocytes and neutrophils and eosinophils, can generate an oxygen-free radical. And this extra oxygen radical causes great destruction in the tissues. Fortunately, their lifespan is short, but even so, they cause destruction in tissues. And the enzyme created by the, in the body, superoxide discutase, is supposed to remove, remove the oxygen radical by oxidation and reduction uh, so that water, hydrogen peroxide, and oxygen are formed. Now, the vascular changes, which are also important, indicate first there's a dermal ischemia and an arachidonic acid cascade or an increased production of prostaglandin and thromboxin, and that means an increased production of clot. Naturally, there's circulatory stasis and corpuscular aggregation that pile back into the venous or arterial system. Then there's arterial obstruction, particularly severe, and the red cells then pile way back in the capillary bed, and a hyaline plug develops in the vascular tree. And here you can see that we have the arachidonic acid metabolic scale. Here are the phospholipids that form arachidonic acid, and they form prostaglandins and thromboxane that contribute to the clotting that's found in the arteries. But at right at this level, you give, we started out with 20 grains and now we're down to five. Five grains of regular aspirin, you can block the formation of prostaglandin and thromboxin, and so we put all our patients with cold injury on that immediately. Now, other vascular changes are tissue edema, which you'd expect, and oxygen ischemia of tissues, compartment space pressure, capillary collapse, and then thrombosis, ischemia, necrosis, and gangrene, and of course, after that, amputation. I show this slide to show you that here's a patient who has some edema, some swelling. His compartment space pressure was up in the 60s. It didn't, we couldn't get pulses palpated uh, or by Doppler, so I started a fasciotomy. This was continued further, but this is the foot, this is the heel, but I want you to see that as soon as you make your cut, you're aware of the fact that there's clotting that's occurred in the venous vessels, and later on you'll find that in the uh, arterial vessels. And two things happen. Number one, when you make the cut, if this is all subcutaneous water, the great big smashing, outrush of water that comes out. And the other is a great big mass of muscle tissue that comes out, particularly when you do the fascial release. So there's two kinds of problems that <coughs> develop there, and uh, all of them require release of the neurovascular <coughs> bundle so that you can get fluid and blood back in the tissues. I show this because this is what happens regardless of what we want. The methods of thawing are in decreasing order of effectiveness. First of all, at the moment, the best method is rapid rewarming water. And we do that at 90 to 106 degrees. Top of the pool, bath, we lift the patient on a crane sometime and put them in a Hubbard tub, particularly if there's associated uh, hypothermia. Now, spontaneous thawing means room temperature. Now, spontaneous thawing to room temperature, if you're in a cabin in the outer reaches of Alaska and you're trapped for treating yourself, your cabin heat is probably 48 to 50 degrees. If you come into Anchorage and you go to Providence Hospital, it's probably 65, and you go to the uh, Alaska Native Hospital and it's 72, and you go to the uh, Air Force Hospital and it's 85, and so who knows what room temperature is? The certainty is different. And the result is spontaneous thawing because it's slow and it allows, it allows thawing and then increased uh, freezing of the extracellular ice uh, are very uh, irregular, sometimes good and sometimes bad. One of the worst methods of thawing is ice and snow technique, cold water and friction massage. And of course the disaster is thawing by excessive heat where you have campfire heat, oven heat, engine exhaust uh, where temperatures are greater than 120 degrees, uh, uh, and the result is very poor. And I'd like to make a little point here at Rapid Rewarming because we do this. If you have one or two or three or even five patients, and you get them and you do Rapid Rewarming in water, that's fine. But if you had 2,000 Marines marching out of the Chosen Reservoir, 
for those in the boats in World War II, and now you find them with their feet frozen and you bring them in, you're not anyway going to find uh, 2,000 whirlpool bass or 2,000 tubs or 2,000 of anything to do rapid rewarming. So we're working a little bit on seeing if we can't improve spontaneous thawing in the cases where large masses of individuals have to uh, be cared for. I'm going down now. This is rapid rewarming. This man arrived and we thawed him on the north slope by radio control. And this is uh, something like uh, uh, 24 hours after. You see a great big nice prognostic sign. The blebs are clear or pink and they go all the way to the fingertips. By the fourth day, he's moving his hands in the world <coughs> and exercising. By the 21st day, he developed a total eschar. Now we have to take the eschar and split it, as you can see here, uh, uh, along the digits. And then we have them, because otherwise this acts as a cast and you're uh, limiting the uh, DIP and PIP uh, joint motion. And here, by the fifth week, he's doing a big exercise program. You can see he's lost a few nails. And here, by the seventh week, it looks as if we have a great result. But if you're going to be doing evaluations, uh, uh, particularly of sequelae of individuals with frostbite, I can tell you that almost everybody who has severe frostbite has residual. I've never examined any, one way or another, who didn't even have, either have clinical or x-ray examination residual. And here, by the seventh week already, is some residual. Here's the flat pad, the fat pad that is uh, uh, almost totally gone in the finger. And here you can see that the intrinsic musculature, uh, this is the first dorsal interosseous muscle, is atrophied to such an extent that it's almost totally gone. And of course, some of the nails are absent. And then there are the changes, neurological changes that you expect in that area. Here is spontaneous sawing the trapper's cabin. He was rescued at three weeks, and this is the way we got him. And he had spontaneously demarcated, as you can see, and we went on and completed the amputation. This is an interesting guy because he had pain in his hand, severe pain. And we were not using anything except FISA hex for washing the whirlpool. But because of Moyer's work in St. Louis with, with burns, I put the one half percent silver nitrate in the solution. And his pain disappeared. The result was the same in the end. But if there are any nurses here, I'd advise you that nurses dislike this totally because it stains all the sheets a terrible brown color, and doctors are not very popular at using it. Now this is delayed thawing with ice and snow, and here you can see the other prognostic sign. Instead of blebs being distal like rapid rewarming, the blebs are proximal, and they're dark and dusky. The toes are blue and cold. This is when 1960, uh, uh, when we first began to, to study the uh, isotopes, and then this patient was in the hospital for 30 days. You can't do that any longer, but here he was a guest of a benign government, and we kept him for quite a while until he demarcated and finally did his amputation. One interesting thing if you're treating anyone with a fresh frostbite, if you amputate the toes or do a metatarsal amputation before there's total demarcation, then there'll be a retraction of tissues and it'll cost you anywhere from one to six or eight centimeters of tissue. So that's why we wait so long. However, there's so much problem with uh, patients in hospital now longer than any, uh, more than two or three days that we've now converted many of their homes into a hospital bed using a whirlpool in their bathtub and that seemed to work out pretty well. This is, can you focus that a little? Is anyone back there? Well, this is thawing by excessive heat. And here you can see that this patient, who was intoxicated, uh, went out and uh, was falling down drunk literally, went to home to a friend's house, pounded on the door. The dogs uh, heard him and awakened uh, the inhabitants. And then uh, they came out and realized he'd frozen his hands and frozen his feet. 
and they tried massage and other things in this little village. Uh, snow and ice, and nothing seemed to work, so they figured that uh, they would melt the frozen extremity, and they had some tea kettle water uh, on the stove uh, uh, simmering, and so they poured the water over the hand, and when it came to Anchorage, you can see that the part that was frozen uh, was also severely burned, so by the twelfth day there was total uh, mummification, and he went on uh, to this level and spontaneously demarcated and amputated the part. It was a terrible price to pay. Now this raises another point that's particularly interesting to uh, cardiovascular surgeons following surgery when they do a beautiful job, everything goes well, and then they reperfuse the heart and the patient dies. Uh, this may have something to do with a sudden onrush of, uh, of potassium. I'm not sure exactly what the cause is at the moment. But first of all, a reperfusion injury is a cellular damage that occurs when blood is reintroduced into the ischemic organ extremity. That would be so if you were treating frostbite as well. And the injury is characterized by no histological evidence of tissue damage while the limb is cold, but followed by cell death only after rewarming or death of the individual in the case of the cardiac surgery. And so we know that the direct injury of cold water, that of ischemic reperfusion, can activate the inflammatory immune response. And a lot of this work has been done by Eisman in Denver. And uh, it may account for the fact that sometime when we do everything right, we think is right in cold injury and thaw very rapidly, that uh, the part continues to develop dangerous change. Is that in focus for the rest of you? No. That's good. Okay, after thawing, I'll go through this rapidly. We protect the thawed part. Use sterile or clean sheets. Treatment is open so you don't cover up the area. We shun macerating dressings. Give whirlpool baths. Leave the blebs intact. Do digital exercises. Avoid debris monitoring and be sure to split the s -car. We use antibiotics only with deep or ascending infection. We use a toxoid booster. Cotton pledges between the digits, but if there's tremendous swelling of the toes, we don't use the pledges. We avoid narcotics if possible. Do early skin graft or late pedicle flaps. And then we choose, if we wish, anticoagulants or vasodilators. Use silver nitrate, and we consider always a fasci fasciotomy. Now, there are many drugs used in frostbite. The plasma volume expanders, low molecular weight dextran, are really quite effective, and we use them often. The vasodilating agents, priscoline and vasodilating, haven't been effective. Lonethidine, a hypotensive agent, used in England quite a while ago. Uh, we tried here, but the problem with using it is that you have to use a tourniquet on the arm or leg uh, during the uh, period in which you're introducing the guanethidine and, and that uh, defeats your purpose. Trentol has not been used well. The fetipin, uh, a calcium blocking agent, may have some use. One of the better drugs is dibenzoline, which is a medical sympathectomy. And when you use dibenzoline at 10 milligrams BID up to 10 or 15 or 20 milligrams uh, TID later on for a period of 10 days, you get an effect just as if you'd done a surgical sympathectomy and you would, in effect, if you wish, get a good idea whether a surgical sympathectomy will be helpful. We use, uh, did use anticoagulating agents, uh, heparin no longer. Thrombolytic enzymes, streptokinase, I'll show you a tissue, or TPA, are effective providing there's no other injury that will bleed when you're utilizing this. Dimethyl sulfoxide, we're not permitted to use. Uh, it's a, it's a vasodilator and a penetrant, and I think it has a lot of use. Uh, the veterinarians use it all the time with good effect, uh, particularly in cold injury of animals. And in fact, uh, I had a vet who told me that someone had a little tiny uh, uh, chihuahua Mexican dog that came in and had some form of cold injury or arthritis. He wasn't sure, but he gave uh, the man some, the, the, the owner, uh, some dimethyl sulfoxide to rub on the dog and see if it would be effective. 
And so the man came back in the, uh, about a week. He said, boy, that is really good stuff. He said, uh, if you don't mind, I'd like a couple of gallons of that. And he took it home. So we have people one way or another that use it, getting it from their veterinarian. Anti-inflammatory agents, non-steroidal, like aspirin, uh, motrin, ibuprofen, have been very effective in breaking up the, the, the cascade. I'll go over these rapidly, but I just want to impress you with all of the various surgical procedures that have been utilized in the care of phosphine, particularly the dermal graft procedures, uh, and uh, particularly the cutaneous pedicle flaps or the muscular cutaneous vascular flap transfers that have been very helpful for us. This continues, as you can see, all the way down to the amputations, and there's so much a superficial or even deep infection with many cases of frostbite that I have often preferred to do a guillotine uh, followed by a closure at a later date, or if I do a closed amputation, I use closed suction irrigation. And uh, another is a joint contracture and releases due to all the contracture and the uh, uh, peripheral muscle uh, contractures that are found following uh, cold injury or, or also following uh, uh, a trench foot or a wet cold injury. A periarterial sympathectomy or microdigital sympathectomy has been helpful, particularly in the area of the hand. And I'd like to make a point about tissue compartment releases. Uh, one of the transitories or permanent uh, sequelae that I don't think I have on my list that I'm going to show you later uh, is that these patients right soon after injury develop swelling in their wrist, swelling in their foot or the tarsal tunnel area, and then they develop that syndrome and sometimes uh, they require a carpal or tarsal tunnel release and it's something to think about if the symptoms don't disappear. Now the prognosis for all of this is best when duration of freezing is short. Freezing not, not associated with hypothermia. Thawing by rapid rewarming, labs are early, pink large, and there's a rapid return of capillary perfusion. That stands the reason. Now here's a young man who started out from this village uh, from Bethel to Eek, and uh, the journey was measured in one and a half quarts of vodka. He was 17 years of age. And when he got to the village, his mother said, we thaw when you have freezing injury with ice and snow. The school teacher said, no, we don't now. We thaw uh, with rapid rewarming. So that was done. First the ice and snow, and then the rapid rewarming. He had the best of both worlds. Uh, this was a young uh, Eskimo boy. And you can see where he had a fishing injury in the past, right there in the, uh, uh, on the right hand, and the uh, middle finger, and apparently cut the neurovascular bundle. So after the 12th week, uh, he had demarcated totally, and we had to do a, an amputation of the part. And then he went home, uh, able to make a full fist with gross motion intact and a lot of loss of sensation, of course. And then he came back because of an illness, uh, other illness, I think it was some abdominal problem, and while he was in the hospital, I was notified he was there, so I took him back, and at this time, we're developing x-ray at the beginning about, we're taking x-rays about 1962 and on, and you can see now, here's further sequelae, particularly in, in younger people. Here you can see the lytic destructive uh, change that occurred in the uh, proximal IP joint, and when we take a close-up look, you can see how this invasion through the cartilage, the articular cartilage, into the bone itself has occurred, and later on I'll show you a past slide that demonstrates that. Rapid rewarming continues to be best. If you exceed the temperature and get up around 150 degrees, you get this ominous cyanelli color, and this really scared us for a while, but by the third day he was coming around well. He lost a little bit of the tip, uh, some epithelial loss here uh, of the second toe, now, it looks very much as if you have an individual who has a good result. But if you look carefully here, you can see that the fat pad is gone. There's atrophic changes, and he has some changes uh, in the intrinsic, intrinsic musculature. So even though grossly everything is intact, you have some other fine loss that can be measured. Here's a man who was a trapper, and uh, 
he caught his arm in a trap and was able to free it. He had an open fracture of his wrist, and we knew that uh, and he was treated uh, again by radiophone, and we had them thaw him uh, in warm water in a splint, and then we debrided the area where he had the open compound fracture and continued the care and the whirlpool and the exercise, and then in about six or eight weeks, we re-operate him and, and uh, fix that with rough pins. Now, the prognosis is uncertain when thawing is spontaneous, long duration, freezing is superimposed and fractured dislocation or associated with soft tissue trauma. And here you have a man who was a mountain climber who was four and a half days on the kidney. During that time, he lost his gloves. He had nothing to eat, nothing to drink, and he had regular mountain climbing boots, uh, uh, coat flak boots uh, that permitted his feet to freeze, and you can see the pattern he had. Uh, when he came into the hospital in Anchorage. And the result was a total amputation at the level of the ankle. Not a refreeze injury, but just a long, deep duration freeze at about minus 50 degrees with wind. And when we did the, uh, a study of the tissues here, you can see the massive clot uh, unresolved uh, that's still present in the arterial system everywhere uh, with the changes equally present in the venous channel, and you can see that if this occurs in over 50% of the individuals, you're probably going to lose the heart. Fractures are a disaster. These men were in an airplane on a mountain. They were caribou hunters, ran into the side of the mountain. One had a fractured spine. Uh, one had this open fracture of the tibia. One had the dislocation of the ankle. The man with a fractured spine and the, the fracture of the tibia managed to haul his buddy down who also had head injury 1,500 feet to a caribou hunter's camp where they were eventually allowed to thaw spontaneously and brought them to an anchorage for care. And as so often the case here, they had this total demarcation and disruption and end up both with BK amputations. On Mount McKinley, uh, we learned a lot and had lots of problems. One of the things here is a Korean party that uh, up in this particular area here, uh, they, they surfaced, or rather, <clears throat> they reached this, they summited on the south peak, and they were coming back down. We don't know whether they were trying to camp on a carnice or they got too close to the edge. But anyway, it gave way, and three of them fell. Uh, the leader went down and uh, fell uh, and hung up upside down with his rope wrapped around his uh, knee and his uh, right femur. The man behind him uh, fell and uh, struck ice and was killed immediately. And the man behind him, were all rolled together, uh, died of a fractured cervical spine before he could be rescued. But our team was here where we have uh, had our camp. And they went over there, it took them about eight and a half hours. And then they brought him back, which made another 16 hours. And he was in a tent uh, where he, he was examined and found to have severe freezing of his right leg, uh, clear to uh, uh, the distal femoral area. And so they decided, with a doctor present, to pack him in ice, which they did. In the meantime, his hands were frozen, and so they thawed them in the tent, figuring he would be uh, rescued soon and brought to Anchorage. Well, he was rescued in 22 hours, and a helicopter brought him in the, into the Anchorage hospital. But an interesting thing happened is in the process of putting him in the helicopter, he managed to get rid of his dressing and his gloves and his hands. And when the rotor blades were spinning, uh, I don't know what the uh, wind chill factor that makes, but maybe 100 miles an hour, uh, the result was that he refroze his hands and got into great deal of difficulty. But when he got into the emergency room, you can see here the freezing had occurred. And another very interesting uh, little problem was identified, however, he had, you hear of dislocation of the knee. Dislocation of the knee is a rare bird, but it happens. And here was the true dislocation medially. Uh, all the collateral ligaments uh, on the medial side were completely torn. The uh, anterior and posterior ligaments were torn. And uh, we thought him eventually in the emergency room in the surgery. And then we did an arteriogram, and here's this incidentally showing the severe dislocation. The arteriogram showed that there was no blood supply at the 
the area of the popliteal artery, and so we operate him, and he had completely transected the popliteal artery and vein. And we did a fasciotomy at the same time. You can see there was no hope of closing these tissues. And we took a graft from the left uh, leg in the uh, saphenous graft and applied it to the area of the tear. And this man went back to Korea, having lost only uh, the large toe and some segments of uh, the metatarsal region uh, on the right side. Now, ordinarily, if, if we hadn't done the repair in six hours, we would expect to lose the leg at the level of the knee. But because this man was in a frozen state, essentially in a metabolic icebox, had no oxygen demand of the tissues, he was able to survive 24, 22 to 24 hours uh, before he came to the emergency room uh, without a, a loss of limb, which is uh, uh, quite was quite effective, and we were quite pleased with the result. The prognosis is poor. When thawing is delayed, ice or snow, you know that, thawing by excessive heat, thawing by any method followed by refreezing, or freezing is superimposed on long-standing immersion. Uh, this is a man who thought if a little bit of heat is good, a whole lot is better, so when he, he's a fisherman out in the Aleutian area, so when he froze his hands, he stuck them in an oven. And uh, what he had then essentially was a burn uh, superimposed on freezing. There was no help for this. Within six to seven days, he demarcated totally and went on to an amputation. This is a gentleman who was working up in a slope, uh, working for a U.S. government project, as a matter of fact. He went out Saturday night, and they had a big party. And he was on watch beginning at midnight. And unfortunately for him, he drank a lot. And then they were snorting some cocaine, as you can see. And uh, he froze his hands, froze his feet, and froze his nose, which, because the cocaine caused the phasic constriction of the area and the temporary loss of blood supply. He had this pattern right here, as you can see, on the, the right hand. And then three days later, all of a sudden, the pattern changed where before we thought we had total uh, perfusion, suddenly the demarcation was at the level of the wrist. So we took him to surgery and uh, <clears throat> used uh, a uh, streptokinase form of cloth dissolution thrombolytic enzyme and for 12 hours, this part was beautifully perfused. It looked like we were going to save the hand. His nose, by the way, responded to cold packs because of the good blood supply. And suddenly the nurse called me somewhere in the middle of the morning and said, you better come in right away to the thermal unit. There's blood all over the ceiling. And this man had suddenly given way, and their blood had spouted out everywhere. And one of the problems, of course, is when you're using a thrombolytic enzyme, is that everywhere you make a cut, uh, there's probably going to be bleeding. And everywhere there had been capillary injury, uh, when the th total thawing occurred, there was bleeding, and the result was a disaster, and he went on to lose his hand at the wrist. So we're very careful with that use. This is another man in the Bering Sea. He was in a helicopter. The uh, helicopter crashed up around the Diomedes, and uh, there were three aboard. Two died immediately, and he climbed up on a hill with his uh, uh, electronic finding device and signal twice a day. He tried to keep his left hand intact and his right hand he used for climbing and using the instrument and he froze both hands of course and on top of that in the accident he had a Montagia fracture here you can see the dislocation of the radius which is important later and all we did was uh, I just put the ulna together and the radius immediately came back in place. And you can see the technician scan showing the tremendous damage and loss of perfusion of the part. And he went on to a pretty rough uh, result. Uh, here you can see uh, on the right, he's lost almost everything. He's now an electronics engineer at the University of Fairmont, believe it or not. And about uh, nine months later, because of complaint of pain. We took an x-ray of his elbow, and here you can see a great big bony mass that formed, which was the formation, calcific formation, 
that it occurred from the, the uh, dislocation of the radial head. And the radial head was sitting right underneath the medial artery and vein. And so this man came up with a tremendous residual, as you can see, in one of the true sequelae of a severe cold injury, probably a freeze thaw refreeze injury, is amputation. Here's a mountain climbing group, and I show this because they wore boots, and a mountain McKinley at something like 15,000 feet, you're at half an atmosphere. And so when you climb at 15,000 feet and go higher, if you have on boots with neoprene liners, for instance, and you tighten the boot laces, uh, then swelling is not permitted to go out. So all the swelling goes down, the pressure goes down against the tissues. And here this neoprene area, so you see this area of the boot here caused a crease within the, the uh, foot itself and caused great loss of tissue, as you can demonstrate here. And the, the tech scan shows the total loss that occurred. So you have to have room to expand because McKinley is a different mountain, a cold mountain, than any other mountain, uh, particularly those in South America or uh, in, in the uh, area of Tibet and Asia. Now, uh, here's another patient who, uh, on Mount McKinley, this is his partner, had a dehydration uh, injury, had no water for approximately five days, no food, froze his hands, froze his feet, and this is the ultimate price that he had to pay uh, for that little bit of freeze thaw, refreeze injury, and they were lost at somewhere around the 19,000 foot level before rescue for five days in a severe cold. This is a photographer on Mount McKinley who took his hand in and out of his gloves on numerous occasions wearing a Millard mitt, which is a half mitt and he froze his fingers, and this is, he was came in to see us in a frozen state, and this was five days after the thawing. So the mummification in a freeze thaw, refreeze injury begins very rapidly, and there's not much that we can do about it. Another Mount McKinley uh, incident, a pilot drove his airplane into a ridge, and uh, here you can see the frozen extremity. Uh, here's the tech scan shows that the loss of perfusion at this level. Here is the frozen extremity and demarcation uh, at the level of the ankle. He got out and tried to hike around and got back in the airplane and he was a true freeze thaw, uh, refreeze injury. This is a children's frostbite. This is the hand of an eight-year-old girl, even though she looks to be three or four, and you can see the amputation area. And the secret here was that her mother committed suicide and put the baby and a sheet at 70 below outside uh, a home in Fairbanks, and uh, she laid in the snow and died of hypothermia. This child was placed in a tub and warmed at 65. <coughs> Her temperature was 65 degrees and warmed in uh, warm water at uh, 106 to 110 degrees. And eventually, now, as I told you, she's seven years old. You can see the results that occur in children. She has the epiphyseal lysis of all the cartilage. The cartilage of the Growing carpal bones or any bones in a child are refractory, are, are uh, susceptible to cold. And you can see wherever she had a plate, the plate had a dissolve with epiphyseal lysis. And if you pulled on these hands, they would stretch out approximately three or four centimeters because there's no bone at all involved. Well, there's a new player in the game, and the player are the people at NASA. Here's an astronaut, he happens to be Story Musgrave who uh, was in Alaska just last week, and uh, he was down practicing for the Hubble space mission, and uh, he froze his fingers at minus 142 degrees Fahrenheit. He was treated in the usual fashion. And then they sent him to Anchorage for care, and we eventually decided that he could go out on the next mission. And he did, and there he is in his bucket, and he managed to be out there in space where if you face the sun, the temperature are something like four to five to 600 degrees plus Fahrenheit. And if you turn the other way, it's minus 100 to 300 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. And so 
Uh, we can anticipate uh, more problems in space. I don't know whether they fall under the Veterans Administration or not. This is the young nurse who uh, was uh, Katrin Junga. Uh, she was flown from uh, Nepal into Anchorage, and she's at the 20,000 foot level. They spent a lot of money, she and her husband, who was an uh, anesthesiologist, and uh, to get the, to this position uh, in Nepal, in that mountain. And so she froze her toes and her fingers at about the 16,000 foot level, but decided not to turn back because she come put too much effort into this uh, to give it up. So here, at 28,000 feet, they pitched their tent. Her Sherpa had frostbite. Her husband had high altitude cerebral edema and died on the mountain and was left there on the glacier. And they walked down, she and the Sherpa together. And when she came to Anchorage, this was the pattern she had, and this was a technician scan. And she's now three weeks along. There was nothing we could do for a freeze or a refreeze injury. So, uh, it's a terrible price to pay. Well, I have to show you some here. We have street people in Anchorage, as you do. And here's a man who was living in this particular area with many bottles. Uh, he was finally found after 10 days, freeze thaw, refreeze injury, hypothermia. Blood sugar was 900. Uh, we brought him into the hospital, and I treated his hypothermia. Uh, as I recall, his uh, core temperature was 79 degrees. We put him in a tub and thawed not only his feet, which were totally frozen, uh, but used peritoneal dialysis with three or four exchanges and uh, brought him around. Uh, and he lived, he survived, except here you can see, again, one who has a freeze thaw, refreeze injury. And you you know, you know wonder when you have particular Marines uh, in the chosen reservoir, or people on the bulge, uh, uh, people have to keep on marching and working and fighting, uh, and they have no time to be warned of how you can avoid a refreeze injury. This is what we call, I call a basal, uh, labile vasomotor system disease. This is very common in women. Some people think it's a Raynaud's, but it's so common, I'm not sure that it's Raynaud's uh, disease. But this is usually found, that if you have 100 cases, 90 of them will be women, and it can be such that if the temperature is 60 degrees and they go outside and bare their hand and hold it up, in the wind, the temperature drops to 55 degrees, they'll blanch. And they blanch either along the median and ulnar distribution or along just the ulnar distribution. And we found that if you use biofeedback on these people, particularly in the feet, or use it in hospital patients, that within here, for instance, you can change and fill up uh, uh, the capillary system within three or four minutes after six or eight weeks of training. Well, fortunately, we're on five slides of a break, and I want to show you some of the things that you're going to be looking for with sequelae. First of all, in determining a cold injury sequelae, you need an adequate history of cold insult. If you have someone who's a, in a tropical climate, obviously, you're not going to consider, generally speaking, unless they had a, a, a water immersion injury, that they have a cold insult. So you want the presence of temperature so low by history is to cause freezing of tissues. For instance, in the Choison Reservoir walkout, there's no question with those temperatures for 15 days at minus 70 or 80 degrees with wind, that they were in a milieu amenable to cold injury. So you then might have freezing of tissues, which is frostbite. You have a non-freezing peripheral cold injury, that's immersion injury trench foot. And we used to say exposure to temperatures near, but not at freezing levels. But now I consider that if you have low temperatures below freezing, that might be uh, in something like this. You can still have, particularly with vapor barrier boots or other boots, have it so cold the tissues freeze, except what you have are tissues that are cooling and cold, but non-freezing, and that itself will a, a problem of, of um, not only immersion injury, uh, but any kind of a cold injury short of actual freezing. Now the transient signs are sweating or hyperhidrosis, hyperesthesia, limitation of motion of the IP and NP joints, joint swelling, edema, 
got a thin, fragile epidermis that's very rapid and very easily injured, nail loss or nail deformity, intrinsic muscle atrophy, fat pad atrophy at the tips, and also that tarsal tunnel or, or carpal tunnel syndrome that very often develops. Now the long-standing sequelae, and these are usually permanent, they have deep, thick scars over the areas, atrophy of, or fibrosis of the uh, intrinsic small musculature. The digital joints are contracted so you have a hammer or claw toe. You have bowler fat pad loss, hyperesthesia of the distal tips, increased sensation, increased sensitivity to cold and heat, decreased proprioceptive sense. Most of these people who are workers are unable to pick up small screws to determine whether they have a nickel, a dime, or a quarter in their hands. Permanent nail deformity. You have x-ray evidence of peri- and subarticular lytic destruction of bone and cartilage, particularly the small digits. Avascular necrosis of bone, particularly in the phalange, the metatarsi and the tarsi. And in children, of course, you've seen the epiphyseal necrosis, total destruction of the physis or growth plate with joint and phalangeal deformity, angulation, and shortening. This is followed by chronic ulceration infection, sometimes osteomyelitis. There's decreased capillary perfusion. Rare findings of squamous cell carcinoma in a persistent sinus tract. I've seen this in osteomyelitis. I've never seen it uh, in, in a cold injured patient uh, that I've treated, and it may be because of the methods we use in the system, particularly with the whirlpool. This is followed by IP joint immobility or fusion, and then the ultimate of uh, long standing sequelae, which is amputation. Well, let's take a break here, if you would. I'm so familiar with and may be helpful to you. This is a gentleman who. Uh, had a myocardial episode and fell in the snow. He froze his hand. He was brought to the hospital and we thought in the whirlpool bath at the usual temperature of 100 to 106 degrees and he suddenly appeared to have a second episode uh, of angina and we took him out of the bath to treat him. And he was in the, incidentally, if you want to know how long they thawed, the patients are kept in the whirlpool bath until the tips flush. And as you can see, his never, woo, his never flushed, and he uh, had this uh, discoloration present. And wherever he failed the flush, he had the gangrenous change occur, and he developed this situation. Now, uh, after three or four years went by, he had good hands. He could, he was a, a, he lived out in the woods. He could chop wood. He could feed himself and he could cook a little bit, but you can see the tremendous arthritic changes that developed after this uh, cold injury. And it, about this time, incidentally, uh, what I did in the past uh, 30 years at least, every time anyone has had a cold injury, I documented immediately with a, an AP of both, or both hands. And the reason for that is that in six months at the earliest, or 18 months, if there's going to be a change, you'll have changes in the, the bones that may represent something anywhere from uh, osteoarthritis uh, to uh, localized metastatic disease uh, to gout, and uh, they're liable to have their hands biopsied if someone isn't aware of the changes that can occur. And so here you can see uh, within uh, three or four months after his freezing injury, he already has some narrowing and perhaps there's some punctate change at the beginning here uh, in the uh, uh, proximal phalanges maybe some narrowing up in the area of the distal phalanges. And then when we see him three years later, we notice that there is some narrowing. There are many areas, punctate areas, destructive areas, uh, secondary or nearby uh, the IP joints. And I'll show you what that means in a minute here. You can see it throughout the area. Well, this man, after living a good life somewhere in his 80s, died, and he willed me uh, through uh, his physician, uh, the opportunity to biopsy his fingers, which I did. And in the process, this is what I found, which will tell you why so many of the patients you're going to see have limitation of motion and other changes. 
here you have the proximal phalanx of the involved digit. <clears throat> here you have the middle phalanx, number five. Here you have the PIP joint and the cartilage surface right through here. And here you see a break in the cartilage surface and a tremendous mass of exploding uh, fibrous tissue going in to this cavity in bone right through here into the middle phalanx. Now you can see this is locked. If this small digital joint has this tremendous uh, exchange of fibrous material, then there's no way you're going to have motion and no matter how hard you try unless you do something about it. And when we get a close-up view, here's the cartilage and here's the bone, this is the cartilage, and now you see that big intrusion of uh, fibrous material. Now, I'm going to go through this pretty rapidly and show you a man that was out uh, in a snow machine and was hunting, and he came uh, after some thawing in the machine. We then rapidly rewarmed him to uh, Anchorage, and here he is on the first day of presentation. Here he is on the second day of presentation. On the right side, you can see there's been some excoriation of skin here. Uh, he has sufficient uh, clear blood formation to let us think that he might sit and salvage his tissue. And here he is uh, about the 15th day, and you can see that both feet were involved uh, of the same degree. And here he is after I applied a skin graft to the area, and you can see the nail changes. He's going to lose this nail, this nail. He's already lost this nail and has some changes that occurred up in there. And then we took an x-ray. We'll make this, this is about uh, uh, two or three weeks after his injury. This is 64, and you can see more or less an, a, a normal AP view uh, of a foot. And this is what he looked like clinically at that time. Here you can see the skin graft recovered. <coughs> this is an area of hyposthesia, decreased sensation. Some of the nails are still gone. This is an area throughout here of uh, anesthesia. And in 66, which is two years later, you can see he's already developed the punctate lytic changes in bone. He has severe loss and destruction of cartilage as well as bone throughout the uh, MP junk joint area. And in 1969, he has further increased destruction of bone and sclerosis through the region. Uh, he has atrophy uh, uh, of uh, the bone in this region as well as the destructive changes, the osteolysis and chondrolysis and involvement of all these small joints. And actually, as you'd expect with this, mark limitation of motion. In 71, this is continued. Although the sclerosis is beginning to disappear in the area, and now you can see in, in the distal aspect of the third metatarsal, tremendous change in bone right in this particular area here. And you know now from what you saw on that slide that that's an excursion uh, of fibrous tissue. And now in 1978, you can see that he has almost fusion. It looks like he's going to have fusion of uh, the MP joint and the other changes here, particularly the, the metatarsal and subluxation uh, uh, laterally uh, of the uh, MP junction here. In 1985, some osteoporosis is identified. This is clearing a little bit, uh, perhaps. He has considerable discomfort on walking, however. And this is the same pattern. And now you can see that the foot has nail changes occurring. Uh, right foot is much worse uh, uh, than the left. He denies hyperhidrosis, however, which is one of the sequelae we're often aware of. And he has considerable nail changes developing. And here we find him at the same time. And only this was 1996. And you can see the nail bed changes that have occurred, roughing uh, fat pad loss uh, here of the large toe, uh, right affected uh, uh, more than the left. Pedal pulses are intact, but the posterior tibial pulse is more uh, uh, palpable uh, than the anterior tibial pulse. And the x-ray now in 1997, which is uh, 33 years after his injury, demonstrates uh, a total loss of the cartilage surface almost a complete fusion and limitation of motion of the MP joint, and all of the joints show a considerable loss, and some of the changes, the punctate changes, are still present. He has problem with weight-bearing and a little bit of hyposthesia, uh, 
uh, but again, no hyperhidrosis that's supposed to be present. Here you see this man now with the fungus changes and the nail bed changes uh, that are so common uh, following uh, frostbite. Now, this is an interesting patient who froze his hands, and uh, he became quite a legal problem uh, because he was said to be uh, a Raynaud's syndrome. He probably is a Raynaud's syndrome. He froze his hands with repeatedly rapid uh, rewarming, but had tremendous discomfort and pain. And what happened was that he was one of the Raynaud's, if you wish, or labile vasomotor uh, problems that spat uh, uh, small segments of bone throughout, which is in the literature. And they still having trouble uh, in that fashion, uh, uh, as far as I know. And, uh, Perhaps we're going to have that go on for some time. It's almost as if he had a deep immersion injury. Some of the sequelae we see in Alaska involve ears. This is a boy that, who froze his ears. Oracle was at one large pleb. He was thawed with a towel. This is a gentleman who just uh, accepted his lot to use ice and snow on his ear, and you can see the changes in the Oracle and the helix uh, in a large uh, loss because the ear, as you know, is primarily fibrocartilage and very susceptible to cold injury. This has nothing to do with on the same slide, but as a matter of interest, this is a young lady who was raped, uh, assaulted and raped by uh, some soldiers up in the Wainwright area, and they were not gentlemen. They left her laying uh, on a, a bed uh, uh, without uh, a mattress, and when she rose off the springs uh, the following morning, and she was pretty intoxicated, she left a large part of her anatomy attached to the springs. This young man is a fisherman. He came into the hospital, I've never seen him before, uh, from deep out in the Aleutian chain with this pattern of extrusion of the distal phalanx, thing, phalanges of the fifth to fourth uh, digits, some segment of the mid uh, digit. And uh, apparently, this was a wet, cold injury uh, uh, with gradual uh, ganglionous change of the tips, and he had, he said they weren't bothering him, they drained a little bit, he saw no reason to have anything done about it. He developed appendicitis, and we convinced him that we could remove uh, these phalanges and give him a much better result than that did happen. But we see this sort of a thing occasionally. Amputees uh, have sequelae as a result of their freezing injury because some of them, in wearing the socket, collect water, they perspire, they're hyperhydrotic. The water fills up, uh, or uh, a certain amount of the socket is filled with water, and then uh, that area freezes, and now you have a stump that's encased in, uh, in ice, and uh, it gets some very interesting changes. i show you another picture of this young lady, but this was taken when she was 85 years of age. She worked uh, up around flat, she did laundry. She came to Alaska soon after the Klondike, and she froze her feet on uh, many occasions, trampling around through the interior of Alaska. And each time, she thawed her feet uh, using warm coal oil, or cold coal oil, which is a very interesting phenomenon that we have for people in the north. And I can't complain, even though those are pretty sad looking digits. She managed to work up there for a long time before she left Alaska. Here is the young man that uh, had the deep lead that was warmed uh, uh, with uh, warm packs, and he had a very good result without uh, a loss of tissue. Here's a young man that used ice and snow, like that elderly gentleman who didn't have such a good result, uh, and the fiber cartilage has been totally destroyed in the area. Just as an aside, uh, for a long time in Alaska, people wore haircuts like mine. And then along came uh, a period of time when everyone wore long hair, the girls had never had much of a problem freezing their ears, but the boys had had lots of problems. And then when we had the hippie era in Anchorage and other areas, I never saw anyone with frostbite of the ears. Uh, then back in vogue again came uh, short haircuts. And back in vogue, sure enough, one high school team had one half of its members uh, with frostbite of the ears. So in defense of long hair, here's a close-up view of the a uh, young man who has extrusion of his distal phalanges uh, of untreated, wet, cold injury. This is the lady from flat, and you can see the changes now. The fat pads are gone, the intrinsic uh, muscles are gone. There's tremendous deformity uh, of nail bed uh, 
and this almost uh, looks like extrusion of bone, but that's a deformity of nail. We had this man who was caught in a blizzard, and his sequelae is such that I just want to show as one slide, but he'd been in the hands of the plastic surgeon now for a long period of time. You don't often see injury to the face, but it can occur. And this is a deep injury, had severe freezing injury of the maxillary area in the cheek, clear on into the buccal cavity, so that some of the jaw and some of his teeth had to be removed, and uh, a pedicle flap placed over uh, this particular area. One of the sequelae that you see often, I see often, have to do with feet particularly. And here's a man who was six months after freezing injury involving uh, his toes. I took an x-ray soon after injury. I took an x-ray in six months and found nothing. And then he came back in the office and I took an x-ray about a year later and look what's happened. You have avascular necrosis, degeneration and destruction of bone right through the area of the calcaneus bilaterally. And that period he had some slight blood formation in the heel, but I didn't think he had enough of that problem. He went on to a fairly decent result after a, a, a triple arthrodesis. Was there any pain with that when it had the construction? No. So it's very similar to shark mode. Similar. He, did, he didn't complain. I, I didn't like the appearance of the foot, so I took the extra I really didn't expect anything like that. Well, this is a very interesting case. Um, this is a man who is a very prominent person, was a prominent person before he died in Kodiak, Alaska, who came to my office, make sure I have the right man, yes. He came to my office and said that he'd been in the Battle of the Bulge, he was a company commander. He had such severe problem with his feet. He didn't know whether it was frostbite or trench foot. And I gathered after talking to him that this was probably trench foot. And he said, you know, when I was over there, they almost amputated my feet. I could. I would be cleaned up, and then I would drain, and then I would have uh, numbness and tingling and edema and swelling and, uh, and on and on, a whole litany of what appeared to be trench foot injury. When I saw him, you know, I said, well, that's a pretty good looking foot. And then when I photographed the bottom, you can see here, the punctate macular papular areas right here and here and here. This was a macular sort of a pustular area, and sure enough, some of these broke out. He was still draining not quite an osteomyelitis. I took an x-ray and it was nothing. Nothing that I could see, nothing the radiologist could see. But he continued to have a discomfort and pain and occasional draining. And they sent him down here and I think he was treated at the Veterans Administration Hospital. Well, the interesting thing was that he, while he was here, he had an angina attack and uh, had some myocardial problem. And they treated him with Coumadin. And for, from that time on, until 10 years later when he died, he never had a single episode of a trench foot symptom. I throw that out for all of you investigators because I was going over my notes before I came down here and suddenly realized what Mr. Kraft had had. And I don't know, uh, I, I, I don't know how the, this correlates or relates because Coumadin is an anticoagulant as far as I know and not much else. But at any rate, he was cured. This is the, what we call an Alaskan thumb, or this is a thumb that I have and other people have to work out in the cold or go hunting or fish in the wintertime. And you see the fat pad loss, this is what I meant. And it's very common in northern individuals. Here's the result of a man whose dog team ran away, or rather, his, he was in a Jeep, and a dog team came by him, and to avoid hitting the dog team, he ran the Jeep into a snowbank. He got out to put an extra cape the Jeep and ran down the road. His shoes uh, uh, got stuck in the snow and ice, and then he ran barefoot until he came to a, an area where there was a power plant and in front of diesel generator exhaust between 175 and 185 degrees, he thawed his feet. And this was the result. You see he burned, the superficial burn. He was sent in for amputation of his feet. But when we did something like this, we realized that he had epithelial tissue forming below, and he only required a transmetatarsal amputation. So, and this is another patient with frostbite. These are the sequelae the amputation, which is an end result. But I wanted to tell you that whenever I do an amputation or metatarsal amputation, or at any level, I always treat him with close suction irrigation. And the reason for that is that 
there's always bacteria in cases like this, and when you use the close suction irrigation, you wash out the bacteria, and I continue that for six or seven days. Now, here's another case which is kind of interesting. This is a young man, 18-year-old boy. No, this is someone else. This is a, what is it, a young man who uh, drank a lot. We brought him into the hospital, and we thought his feet. In the process, uh, he, he didn't even give this much thought because he seemed so young. Anyway, he developed delirium tremens. He jumped out of bed, uh, broke a window, and ran down the street for five or six blocks and then had further injury and refreezing. And he ended up with something like this, as you can see. Fortunately for him, only the loss of the distant tips. When he was discharged from the hospital, you can see that he had a segment of the large toe uh, surgically removed and had this level of hypesthesia, this level of anesthesia. And when we took him to surgery, you can see right here that he had a loose segment of bone uh, when I did the metatarsal amputation. This is what he had prior to surgery, too, with complete uh, a web space contractor, a real hammer toe deformity of the feet, secondary to his freezing injury. And here in the close-up is the segment of bone that was uh, necrotic and it failed to heal, heal, and there was approximately uh, uh, two centimeters by one and a half centimeters in size. Well, we had other problems. In Vietnam, there was a form of wet cold injury. It really wasn't a cold injury. It's an immersion foot. Uh, but the point was there was sufficient uh, loss of heat to cause the transfer to go away from the body uh, in, uh, to the cooler water. And here you can see the changes, the wrinkling uh, uh, that is found in the, these particular individuals. Uh, loss of sensation, uh, pain usually, and uh, generally speaking, uh, this is very similar uh, in appearance, isn't it, to someone who's been in a bathtub uh, uh, for any uh, length of time reading a book or soaking up the water. He has pitting uh, keratosis uh, uh, throughout the area. And uh, I, I show this particularly because this is a, was a Marine uh, from one of the battalions that uh, we made the landing with in the I Corps area. This is one of the Vietnamese who had already lost part of his foot and was wearing a sandal type apparatus. And the point I wanted to make is that the Vietnamese people uh, we practically won the war for them by our discarded uh, materials, including uh, our tires and other things, and they made shoes out of them or sandals, and they had no trouble. The Viet Cong and, and uh, some of the Vietnamese troops who wore sandals, and the people who worked in the rice paddies could work night and day and for long periods of time without developing these immersion foot problems. And the Marines who wore uh, their tropical boots or uh, other boots uh, sometimes couldn't be talked into taking off the boot. Uh, because there might be a firefight at any time and they wanted to be ready to go and consequently uh, they often wore uh, boots and socks uh, that were wet and developed this other uh, problem. But most of the immersion problems were solved by uh, three or four days in bed. Here's a Catholic priest who developed some changes in bone and you can see the nail changes that had occurred uh, in him. And here's his companion, another priest, both of them were involved in a dog team travel, they both had sustained frostbite, and here he has uh, a necogryphosis, uh, or ram's head deformity uh, of the nail, uh, followed associated with a fungus infection that's not uncommon. Now sometimes we see adults that come into our place, and sometimes young adults have the same problem, but here's a boy who was about 14 or 15 when he froze his hand, and you can see if you look at the left hand, the right hand, there's some changes here and some deviation radially in the index of the mid finger. And when you take a look at the x-ray, you notice that there are some epiphysteal changes uh, that have occurred in destruction, epiphysteal destruction in this region. And for reasons that I'm not sure, much of the literature is devoted to the fact that these have a radial deviation. Now what that means, I'm not sure, except it happens. This is a close-up view of a Mount McKinley guy. And this is the type of brain out phenomenon, if you wish, or Laval basin motor uh, situation that we often find one post-cold injury or two in individuals who have this anyway and uh, have a predisposition uh, to cold injury. 
Now, I wanted to show you just a few slides before I quit. Um, what, how you determine whether or not there's real loss. Now, some people have used thermography. We have as well. And here's a, a climber from McKinley. And you can see here that he has a um, thermographic study of his left and his right hand. According to the thermogram, there's a tremendous loss of tap wave perfusion on the fourth finger on the left, as well as all the fingers on the right. But when you take a, a study with a Technetium 99, you can see that the perfusion, heat perfusion, demonstrates with the exception of this area of the thumb here, which is also demonstrated here. But there is a very ad adequate capillary supply. So what you have to do is recognize that sometimes the thermogram will measure only the superficial loss. And it doesn't give you an idea of what's going on in the deep structures. And here's another uh, Chinese patient with, uh, you can see the dark discoloration here with a considerable loss that does eat the area where you have uh, some of the changes. But you can see over here that this is, demonstrates considerable loss of of heat and capillary perfusion, but here the, there is some evidence that, that capillary perfusion is present on the technician study. Now, this problem is superficial and deep. This patient was also sent in to Anchorage for amputation and for at least a four foot amputation. And we took him to surgery because we had no pulses and he did have a pull of foot. He just happened to take uh, uh, one of the instruments and start lifting off the S bar, and you can see that this shed, just like the uh, the cicatrix of an insect. And so underneath he had nice clean epithelial tissue and went on to a very excellent result. So uh, if you have a frostbite, it's very difficult to see and sometimes any more than superficial without the other, uh, other investigation. This is what I think is probably the best booth in the market at the moment. Uh, I'm sure there will be others to come along to rival it. But this retains heat. The only problem is if you're someone who perspires a great deal, it also fills up with water, and you have to avoid the problems of having immersion injury. It's interesting that uh, the companies that made this boot for the uh, Army, Navy, and Marine Corps went out of business and understand in case we have cold trouble, we probably don't have enough of these boots to satisfy the division. Well, the problem with cold is wherever you are, you think heat. And if you can keep your skin temperature uh, above 26 degrees Fahrenheit and your core temperature above 94 degrees Fahrenheit, you'll never have much problem with cold. Thank you.